All right, Hardy and, and JB. Thank you, JB, for saying hello. Sherry, sound is good. Everything's wonderful. Thank you. Well, it's exciting to come in to the end of the year and say, where have we come and what have we done? And first off, I want to say, um, despite how we're looking in the market right now, uh, I'm excited for 2023. Usually we see some kind of a rebound. I know that every day it seems that the market's gone down. We had wild rides, the big rally that occurred in the summer. And again, the failed fall break. And then the Santa Claus rally that's not really here. But um, there, and I guess the one thing that that was that really stood out was that the beginning of the year, and I, I do this frequently for all our subscribers, I put out a list of stocks at the end of the year. That we call them the dogs. What was down, and generally there's a few rules that we look at. And they've got to make some money. they got to have a dividend, that kind of stuff, little things like that. But stocks that were down into the December 20th expiration, and a lot of them are still down and went down even more, tend to reverse and bring, bring buying opportunities in 2023 under normal years. And I think we all can scratch off a normal year with the Federal Reserve since uh, 2008 with quantitative easing, now doing quantitative tightening. Uh, we have the highest rate of uh, Fed funds and everyone knows that. But is it all, is it, it, can we handle it? Can we handle higher rates? Um, and many of you that like me could remember their four, first mortgage uh, at 14%, some people even say 18% on a 30-year fixed, way back, or maybe that was a 15-year, I don't remember, uh, way back in the day. And I'm talking in the in the early 80s, 1984, uh, 85, 86, in that era. People still did business. The market still moved. It was just more expensive and knowing your cost of doing business. And that's the fear of the market. Nobody really knows what the cost of doing business will be. And that's why the market's very hopeful that the Federal Reserve takes some clues and hints from not just big businesses, politicians, but everywhere else that says, hey, we've got a global central bank, uh, global central bankers all gotten together and have all tightened at the same time, sort of speak. The U.S., of course, has done the most. And on the side note, the U.S. did the most quantitative easing. So it's it's only natural that we increase the most quantitative easing that we increase the quantitative tightening so moving forward into next week and beyond uh, i wanted to take this time to reflect on our pug meeting where did we come from this year and what was the one thing that if there are any regrets what do i regret i probably regret uh if anything uh being lighter in my positioning than i normally was in the fund j pam being a lot because of the volatility and because of the fundamental and longer term outlook to be remaining in cash, which turned out to be one of the uh, good God blessings because uh, we still saw rates. The, the best place to be this year was cash, actually. So um, we now have uh, an opportunity that if we see recovery, we're going to see some increases. One of the other uh, debacles of the year has to be cryptocurrency. And we all know about Sam Bankman Fried and the FTX debacle which is the whole point of today's presentation. Um, I'm very happy to go over and, and review, which is what I wanted to do because I was asked, I was asked, hey, are you still into crypto? And the funny thing is this question was presented to me last year when crypto and, and Bitcoin was at like around $60,000. And, and I simply said, listen, um, I, I'm here's what I would intend to do with cryptocurrency. And uh, we waited and saw an opportunity when uh, Bitcoin had fallen off that 60,000 and got down around, if you recall, we'd had that big mini crash at around 42,000. Since then, we're trading just north of 16,000 now. But um, I will go over again what we talked about last year and what the plan is and how I said how to trade it. And, and is that going to be applicable for this year? But before we do that, Take a second to just read risk disclosure and know that trading involves risk of loss. Um, I thought I would, before we get into the crypto review, which really isn't that big of a deal, it was quite frankly, four or five names. And one of the names was bought out. So it, 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 it made money weeks after we even uh, uh, suggested to get in it. It was under a lawsuit, but we'll get into that in a minute. I think this is a very important 
uh, page. I think it's um, it, it. I think if everyone is committed to improving in their trading, we have to have some kind of a. Um, I think of, of some type of a plan based on how we are leaving the year. How are we leaving the year? Um, we're leaving the year with uh, more companies announcing layoffs, more companies uh, suggesting uh, home builders, for example, uh, showing that house, there's a slump in housing. I mean, that's been going on for three months. The Federal Reserve, even Jay Powell, his, out of his own mouth, admitting that we haven't felt the full effects of the last rate hikes. And if you think about it, in just in, in six weeks, right, you, you have had two rate hikes. They're every six weeks, right? So if you take the first rate, the, the second to last rate hike, which was three quarters of a point, 12 weeks ago, three months, and then you take one six weeks ago, which are eight weeks now, excuse me, um, it, it, which was another three quarters, and then you take the last rate hike, you have to add these up and say, it generally takes six months for rate hikes to work into the economy. You got almost two full percentage points of Fed fund interest rate tightening, not even felt in the market. Car sales are down. So there's, uh, you know, consumer spending is going to get a little bit tighter. And and markets prepared for this by a lot of a lot of stocks falling off the cliff. Um, but when interest rates go up, certain companies do better. And especially if no one's trading there's something called the float and people make money off the interest rate and broker loan rates go up. So if you're trading on margin, your brokerage firm makes money. And I have um, three names there that I thought would be worthy of, of talking about today, just briefly and saying in the financials, I want to pay attention to Charles Schwab for this year. Um, Robin Hood, many of you may go, oh my God, not Robin Hood. But I want to point out that I've been a big fan of Robin Hood um, just a little bit from where it's trading now, a little lower in the sixes, when we learned that Stephen uh, Quirk, Q, a.k.a. Q, who was at uh, one of the original founding uh, forefathers at Thinkorswim with Tom Sosnoff, and Q uh, elevated to the ranks because he's one hell of a smart guy and he knows the business really well. And I, look what he did with, with Thinkorswim. Look what he did in his reign at, at TD Ameritrade. Robin Hood acquired him earlier this year. And under his guidance, I would say that it's got a very strong potential to be a market leader for a growth story, for a growth story. For a value story, it's got to be Charles Schwab. I mean, they're established. They got billions of dollars on the books. They're going to make tons of dough, tons of cash on the float. And I think they're, they're fairly well uh, established. The other one in the banking, we went over it today in the live trading room briefly, Citigroup. I'm not a, I mean, I own Citigroup from, I don't know, a decade and a half ago before it, it did a 10 for one reverse split. So when you look at this stock at around $45, you got to remember it's a $4.50 stock. But I think that what I see in this is not just looking at the technical picture, um, but fundamentally they should start to see um, more gains on a lot of their holdings. And one of the things that I think is important to note that I think what's given it some popularity or maybe notoriety earlier this year was that I believe Warren Buffett took a stake in City. So uh, that's one to, to, to look at. Consumer staples, if times get tough and it's winter and it's dark times ahead, um, I am still a long-term uh, holder, supporter of Walgreens, WBA. Uh, I believe in Walgreens as far as it pays a dividend. Uh, and, and I think that's going to be important in this year to look at stuff that has lower price to earning ratios with better looking dividends. You got to be a little bit more careful because at the very least, I think the Fed pauses rates. And I think the Fed pauses rates if they raise rates in February. And here's what we got to look for. Next week, we have the unemployment report. And I, I still think that we have a shot at some upside in the market. And, and for that, here, let's get, let's get, uh, let's look at um, a quick chart here because I don't want to spend your uh, all day because I know this is the end of the year. And everyone's got a lot of things going on. Um, so I, I do want to say thank you for visiting with us today. Let's get and take a gander over here at, if I may be so bold, I'm going to open this up. 
what you see in front of you is my work on TradeStation. And what you see here is probably one of the most, I don't know, dynamic gyrations in advanced decline that I've seen in a, in a very long time, uh, showing the kind of trading range of, uh, or at least market manipulation from new highs in the advanced decline to a new low in the advanced decline <laughs> in, in a period of, a, of approximately two months. That's a very strange anomaly. It's something we generally do not see. Uh, more times than not, when you get a new high in the advanced decline, generally the break, the pullback, is one to buy because typically you see the market rally to test the preceding levels high, which would be somewhere up here at 470, which is bizarre in itself. Now, we can't see new highs in the S&P 500 without participation in most of the NASDAQ 100 or what we would call heavy cap weighted stocks like your Microsoft, your Apple, your Netflix, your Google, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see clearly, the NASDAQ 100 has a completely different picture than the S&P 500. First off, you can clearly see that the S&P 500 is about sideways since approximately July of 21. For a year and a half, the advanced decline has just been gyrating while the price is down it's down because of the NASDAQ or technology cap, mega cap weighted sector. On the other side of the spectrum, over on the far right, is the Dow Jones Industrial Average, where the advanced decline is improving. Now, I want you to understand this is a weekly outlook, not daily. This is a weekly outlook. And what uh, we would define as uh, the market if we can close out the year and, more importantly, the week, which is tomorrow. With a positive uptick in the advanced decline, this would indicate that we should at least, if not um, move a little bit higher, testing with a new high, a newer high in the Dow Jones in the coming weeks. I'm not saying hours. I said weeks. Probably the next two to three weeks, we should see a new high or at least a uh, uh, relative high to two weeks ago at 348, maybe test, maybe 350. The one thing that's missing in all of this equation is volume. And volume could certainly come in on any good news if people feel excited about the market or excited that maybe the Fed's going to pause. We could see some of the Dow components back up. Now, with that said, many of you are probably wondering, John, when's, is, is Meta going up? Is, is Facebook that old Facebook that is, is, is Amazon ever going to turn around? I mean, this is a horrific picture with volume. There's no volume in this market. It got liquidated, but it's at, it, it is at odds. And I wanted to point this out, that the, the advanced decline has been what we call, jokingly speaking, in a loving manner, of course, our Sergeant Hulka. If you ever remember the movie Stripes with Bill Murray, he said our biggest, bestest buddy, the big toe of this squad, right, the platoon, is our big toe is Sergeant Hulka. And I would have to say in the field or the work of technical analysis between the weekly person's pivots and, again, the advanced decline work, it's been the two most trustworthy indicators. The PPS indicator ain't that bad either, as you can clearly see. Right now we're in a weekly sell mode, but it could easily be negated with a, another follow through into next week. So the bottom line is this, we're not looking at this point, at this point, a major market crash, in my humble opinion, uh, at this point. Now, if we get another turn and the moving averages are pointing down and the pink line, which is the advanced decline, starts to roll over and reverse, then, it's got problems. And that's the what I'm looking at as far as the advanced decline on a higher time scale. And I thought it'd be something that you need to be aware of and, and say, okay, well, if I'm gonna listen to John Person, show me some factual information rather than someone's opinion. And the facts are the advanced decline, and if we end up positive, today we had a 471 advancers against 25 declining stocks in the S&P 500. If today was Friday, which it's not, it's Thursday, but if today, or let's say tomorrow, we don't negate, in other words, we're not down by 471 stocks tomorrow with decliners uh, at 471 and advancers at 25, 
In other words, if we still have positive participation rate, more stocks up than down, and we close the week out with the weekly advanced decline at a newer high, the odds are, and the, 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 the work suggests that we go back and we test the highs, these highs right there at the very least, if not, maybe perhaps finally, uh, for whatever reason, um, go up to 422 and, and fill a gap up there that exists from uh, when we were in, in, in August. So there's a small little gap in the market right there. I don't know, let's call it 420. Could that be possible? Anything's possible in this world. Most people said the market was going to go down in, in June and July, and the market had a hell of a rally. So, I mean, from 43 with a 40-pointer, you know, less than 27-point rally in the S&P freak anybody out, would it be a surprise? And would it still negate a sideways trading range environment? And the answer to all of that is no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't freak anybody out. Uh, if you were short, you'd be freaked out because the market right now has been set to be bearish. I mean, we're going down. There's going to be a recession. Every day is down in the market, it seems. Uh, people are going to get their 401k statements. They're not going to look pretty good, uh, especially if the market sits at or about right here for tomorrow's close. Um, I would have to argue and say that there, you know, is the trend warm and fuzzy? No, the trend is down. You can clearly see the trend is down. The only difference is that the market internals are able to move like with lightning, lightning quick speed. And the one factor that's been holding the market up, many, many of you are already aware of this, the SPY at least, relative uh, to the Qs, has been energy. And energy is in jeopardy, by the way of seeing a sell-off. So for this, I just wanted to say, when you look at this page and maybe take a photo of it, do your own due diligence, there's a couple of names that I'm I'm actively in and looking at getting in. Uh, Schwab, of course, Robinhood, City, Consumer Staples, Walgreen, Clorox. Um, Tis the season to get, I guess, cleaning up your house at the new year. And that's not the reason I'm doing Clorox, by the way, but um, I'm pretty sure if there's a deep frost and nobody will be doing anything uh, outside cleaning driveways with Clorox, that's for sure. Maybe in Florida. Anyway, consumer discretionary. Disney. Um, Disney's not really um, it's it's last on the list. I think if we're going to see consumer discretionary, I always tell people the most interesting and the most discretionary stock of all are casinos. If you got enough money to pay your rent, pay your light, pay a babysitter or have your parents come in and take care of the little kids, get on a plane and you got extra cash, you're going to Vegas, then you're doing well. And that's consumer discretionary. With true or not true, false, true, false, I'm not quite sure. Is China the open, the no open, the reopen, the let people travel? If that's the case, then we should see for Chinese New Year's a surge in traffic coming to Vegas. MGM would be a major beneficiary of that traffic. Las Vegas Sands isn't going to do too bad either. And Disney, you know, Disney's not really that bad of a play. I'm not saying everyone goes to Disney, uh, but this is the season for theme parks. We had a long discussion at, in this uh, trading community and several people, Trev, I'm going to throw you under the bus, $15 hamburgers, uh, $10 hot dogs. We, we discussed the, today a $5 Coke, $30 to park your vehicle, 50 if you want premier parking. Um, Disney's making money. I believe they're making money. Can they pull off? Uh, and does the street believe in it? That's the difference. And so what John Person feels and what, what the market sees uh, from one minute to the next is totally different. But I do believe at these levels, Disney offers uh, a pretty decent uh, entry for a long-term trader. Biotech Farmer, I'm a big fan of biotech for this year. IBB, uh, Labu is a three-time leverage ETF. Um, gener generic drug maker Teva Pharmaceuticals been under pressure, hasn't done a darn thing. Of course, they were recipient of lawsuits with the their contribution to the opioid crisis. They've gotten through a lot of that. It's an Israeli company, and I sincerely believe that based on the technical outlook, Teva Pharmaceuticals has an upside chance for a nice rally, probably a 30% move uh, sometime in this quarter in the Q1 of 2023. Technology. Um, Listen, uh, this seems like Captain Obvious. Uh, Amazon, Netflix, Checkpoint uh, is the EV charging, charge point, excuse me, not Checkpoint, not, well, charge point. 
charge point and technology. It's kind of like the EV play without having to be in the volatility of Tesla or Lucid Motors or Rivian. Uh, if you have a, a a car and you're gonna an EV and you're gonna charge your car, uh, charge point CHPT is at this price level eight bucks worthy of a shot for a 2023 investment. Netflix, um, generally speaking. I think it's eight out of the last 10 years, or it's maybe it's seven out of the 11 last years. Their earnings, the market has an amazing, uh, um, an amazing positive reaction on earnings, which comes out in about three weeks. Um, the news might be out on that. People might already see that. But what I do uh, see after yesterday's dump, today's little recovery, um, we should at least see a rechallenge between the 310, 330. So option traders may want to be focused and, and as we are with uh, unweighted flies, butterfly uh, strategies uh, might be um, beneficial in a situation like this. Software application, Twilio, call center, um, Adobe software, Snowflake, Salesforce. Nobody likes Salesforce. Um, nobody did like Salesforce. That doesn't mean people won't try to buy it for a recovery. And then finally, uh, Guidewire. They're a software company that's gotten their ass handed to them we missed a long entry by 11 cents and what they do is they they put out software for insurance companies they had an amazing um last quarter earnings report the markets dipped back since then uh it today we were trying to get in at around 59 and change uh had an intraday low yesterday off that uh 59 uh i think we're trying to get in at 59 27 the low was 38 missed it by 11 pennies and then today gapped higher and just took off. Um, so watch Guidewire, GWRE, in the next uh, couple days and see if we get some kind of a pullback, and, and certainly in Q1. Rising interest rates could upset metals in a tightening credit environment. It certainly has, except for silver has broken out. Copper looks posed for a big, bigger or follow through movement. Um, and I'm not sure how long that will last, but it's weird if we're going into a recession, no one's buying houses, cars, how are we seeing an increase in demand or a, a decrease in stockpile of copper to cause copper prices to rise? Other than that, um, gold is currently the strongest seasonal tendency lasting into Q1, like mid to late February. We're long Newmont mining. We're going to stay long via an option. Um, I just think that if we are continue to stay, not just – after this Fed meeting, the Fed may want to have another half point in their books just to round it up, get us close to 5% on the Fed funds, and then be on hold until hell freezes over, which means a world of the market might get a relief if there's more or weakening economic numbers. Focus on that. Weakening economic numbers, job loss. I know that's bad. If you don't lose your job, then it's good as a trader. When you lose your job, then it's bad. As they say, when your neighbor loses his job, it's a recession. When you lose your job, it's a depression. So the fact is, is the Federal Reserve, we are going to see from a seasonal perspective, all the people at the malls, all the seasonal shops, the full-time employers at Macy's and Nordstrom's and all the service sector jobs for the holidays, those jobs are going to get shed more likely than not. And you're going to start to see that in the next job, not the January number, but in the February number. So that's why I say the Fed probably has got one more rate hike, half a point. They get that done. They round us up. And as we get more and more weaker economic numbers and also focus on inflation numbers, both here and in Europe. Um, by the way, nat gas, does anyone follow natural gas? Because many people, I don't know if the media has really been covering it a lot, but has anyone seen a chart on Nat Gas lately with the big frost scare and the big freeze? And Nat Gas is at about the lowest level that we've seen since, well, July of 21. July of 20. Now, excuse me, we're back to May of 21. That's natural gas prices. So with the cold and the frost and the tundra and the blow uh, wind chill factors, Nat Gas was supposed to go up, up, up through the roof. Nat gas hasn't. So I just wanted to point out when I say there's some things that happen. Here's um, energy. 
Crude oil, by the way, has been in a monthly PPS sell mode. It is off the lows. I understand that. Reformulated blend gasoline, it's off the lows. But the refiners and looking at even diesel fuel and heating oil prices, this to me is more indicative of a trading range. And I think we will see a rollover in the energy space as we get into uh, the first quarter of 2023. So that's my my two cents there is we're going to see energies overbought and it's vulnerable for a decline in Q1. So these are kind of things that I think that that we could, uh, I just didn't want to cover everything and just say, look at the page and move on. I wanted to kind of interact with you and say, okay, here's what I'm looking at. And I think that's kind of important. At the end of the week tomorrow, what does it represent? It also represents the end of the month. So let's take a look at a couple names here. One is the Energy Select ETF, the XLE. You know, we're in jeopardy of the energy with a monthly chart, by the way. Just thought I'd throw out monthly higher time frame analysis. I don't know. A lot of people don't really get into higher time frame analysis. But um, when you start to see rallies in the market and momentum of volume starts to move lower, um, and that's exactly what we got going on right now. And we also are at a potential of a monthly low closed doji. I don't know if it'll happen, but if we get an actual low closed doji, that means the market closes below the prior month's low, which was a doji. If you close below that low and the volume has been eking lower, the, some, the, the I mean, if we're only in a, a trading range, by, by the way, and if we're in the weakest time frame of the year, which is now through February, the likelihood that we move lower and fulfill a potential trading range environment with these wild swings is pretty high. So I just wanted to point out that there's a lot of energy names that I think we could see. And I know everyone wants to be an energy and everyone's saying to finally buy energy. But even in the best of times, even in the better of times, I would still argue that I think that now somebody doesn't believe that story because if they did, the volume would still be stronger. And right now it seems like there's profit taking going on in energy. Something is 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 changing. So I thought I'd just warn everybody that's the picture that I see. And, and as an ETF, I think you can kind of watch for that. So um, I'm just saying that energy is overbought and it's vulnerable for decline in Q1. I think the XOP has a shot of filling gaps down around 126. And then lastly, foreign market ETFs, India and FXI, China. If you're if you're thinking that um, you know you want to go with emerging markets, I would stick with the India ETF and the China ETF and, and watch for that if China does reopen. Uh, and and as we get into the spring, these are trades that I think in 2023, and we'll do quarterly reviews and and we'll follow up with these these names in the past we've given out some pretty decent uh uh we've gotten very lucky it's exciting to kind of say okay what does the end of the month stuff look like and quarterly analysis look like and this is what some of the the, the pictures painting here for for short-term trades in the next say 60 90 days um and then again i want to point out and it's in red remain with small exposure to crypto markets and uh, is crypto investing, is it too late? It, is it time to avoid it? I mean, Sam Bankman-Fried, this poor guy, he's going to be living life of luxury in his parents' house for a while. Um, you know, will he do jail time? If it is, it'll be a couple of years. But is crypto dead? Well, you know, maybe certain items are dead. But I just wanted to, to, to tell you at the beginning of this year, I, my plan was to say, listen, small, start small, open an account with a licensed, regulated crypto exchange. And examples were Coinbase, Robinhood, Voyager. Nowhere did we say get involved with FTX. Second off, I said to how to acquire, and I'm going to still stand by this because I think this is smart. My idea is to add over time approximately two and a half percent of your annual contribution based on your risk capital, not retirement capital. So if you're going to throw money in your 401k, you let that money there. But if you have risk capital 
hey, I got a couple grand every month. I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to buy bait. I'm going to do whatever, splurge money. Throw a little of that into some crypto. And I think over the next three to five years, you might be welcome that you did that as long as it's the, some smart ones and over time. And so what I suggested at the beginning of this year, and this is what I wanted to review, at the beginning of the year, I suggested, you know, if you're purchasing only, I don't know, two and a half percent, go with 1200 bucks for the year. It's not a big deal. Just buy a little bit. If you're going to add more, then add more, three, four thousand dollars and and broken up either break it up either monthly or quarterly on big dips and time and price. By the way, this is the exact slide from a year ago. I didn't I didn't create this for today. This was the exact slide from a year ago. There were crypto tokens that I suggested that we get into. Partial tokens can be purchased with Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple was the one I recommended. And then weeks after it was under an SEC investigation, a lawsuit, but you could have bought it through a third party wallet sales and Ripple ripped higher. It got bought out. So Ripple was uh, actually one that was pretty good. Shiba Inu, um, crypto.com is um, Crow, is the crypto.com coin. And then Gala, which is a Ethereum based product. So these were, I still believe in standby, buying, no, no pun intended, bits and add money over time. You're not going to catch the bottom. And quite frankly, I did, I definitely feel that crypto is not going anywhere. Is it a craze? Do I throw everything, my whole life into it? No. Did I throw my whole life into silver? No. You know, I gave everyone a plan of how I was trading silver. I wasn't buying SLV. I wasn't trading options. It was around $17.85. Let's round up. I'll say 18 bucks. And I said, the way I'm buying it is nobody, uh, I'm buying the um, silver coins because nobody wanted 2020 because of the pandemic. And there was a discount between the numismatic value or the coin price and, uh, to the silver price there because there was too much demand. I said, I'm going to pass them out. I'm going to buy a boatload of them, put them in the safe and give them to the grandkids for, for Christmas. They weren't too thrilled. They go, oh, what's this? Now, I think they're in my son's safe at this point. The point is, is that I have silver, which is, you know, it's not really doing a whole lot, but it's better than nothing. And, and I didn't feel like being involved in the futures with the leverage. And I just would rather prefer to own the coins. So my plan for silver never changed. You've got many of you may have heard me give you that 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 speech before. Um, relative to gold, I think silver's done okay. It's I shocked it never went to fifty dollars. I'm shocked gold didn't get to twenty five hundred dollars. Highest inflation in forty years, and nothing really rallied in the precious metal uh, arena. But with crypto, despite the fact that we have a uh, one of the most outstanding scams in history. I mean, records are meant to be broken. And Bernie Madoff is going, man, that guy was better than me at this game. I mean, Sam Bankman Freed, this guy, unbelievable. And, uh, you know, is it is it going to turn crypto away? No. Is the technology never going to be used again? No. Is there demand for crypto? I believe there's still going to be continued to demand for crypto, but you want to be in, in my humble opinion, from my research, Bitcoin itself, Ethereum, you can't buy Ripple. I don't know about Shiba, but you know, what the hell, buy a little bit of it just in case. Um, and those are the, those are where I'm looking at. Um, this was where we planned. And I wanted to make mention to you guys, this is what we planned a year ago. I thought it was good to review. Has crypto done anything? No, it's gotten its ass kicked. I mean, we've got Bitcoin down now to like 16.9, whatever it is. That I didn't check in the last 20, 25 minutes. And I think that I'm not looking at this as a day trade and I'm not using money that I'm afraid of. Um, and so I'm not cost averaging every time it drops. And some people had a plan. If it drops 5%, I'm going to keep adding more money. I don't think that's smart. I think... If this one slide, I just wanted to point out to you guys, time and price. We want to acquire it over time and price with regulated companies. 
time and price right there time and price wait for the market to come down and buy it over time so on a monthly basis do it at the end of the month or the middle of the month quarterly basis do it at the end of the quarter so if you haven't acquired more and this is the end of the quarter tomorrow's your last day you want to probably acquire a little bit more of one or all of the five names on your board here if you can only buy one then buy partial coins of bitcoin that's my two cents i wanted to say thank you very much for today thank you for this year um i hope i've at least delivered uh information that makes you a little better of an informed investor it's been a crazy year there's no doubt about it um it, it's been there was a time where you couldn't even walk away and go to the bathroom and not see the market move one percent you remember the days where we were opening up 40 50 handles s p futures were taking 30 point moves every five minutes we had a little bit of volatility and uh i, I don't know if we're going to see that kind of price volatility we will see volatility but not like we did i believe at the end of the at the beginning of last year because prices have come in so much I will give more presentations uh, throughout 2023. And for everyone here, thank you for your time. That's all that we have for today. I hope you, you can find this uh, recording. It'll be uh, posted on our, our YouTube channel. And definitely take a, a time to go by and look at the stock recommendations as well as what I'm thinking we are going to see some opportunities as we get into the first quarter of 2023. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm excited for 2023. I think it's very positive um, of, of what we see in the market based on the longer term work with the advanced decline. I'm hopeful that we get some kind of a recovery rally. And uh, I want everyone to be happy and safe and have a, a very warm, heartfelt New Year celebration. And I'll see everyone in 2023. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your, your evening as well as the year.